I now welcome Professor Avinash Prasad, an esteemed economist who is going to introduce his highly anticipated Prasad lecture series. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure to open with a few words about the Bishnodat Prasad Memorial Lecture Series and this year's distinguished speaker, Governor Francois Villois de Gallo. Bishnodat Prasad, known as Vishnu to his friends, was born in Berbice, British Guiana, in 1933. He was the grandson of indentured laborers from India. At the age of 21, he arrived uh, on the boat uh, to London, uh, where he worked first in the ticket office of the London Underground, then as a bus conductor in the days before the 1955 Clean Air Act, for all of those interested in public policy, so back then, conductors had to uh, walk in front of the buses holding a lamp uh, during the, the winter uh, evenings because of the, the depth of the smog was so impenetrable. Uh, and, uh, uh, and after 55, uh, that uh, cleared away. But that was the life of a bus conductor in the 1950s. It was his branch union official who could have dismissed him as a shy, quiet, boy from the colonies who urged him to use his school certificates to enter university. He went to Queen's University Belfast, where the bus conductor from Berbice won a first class honours in economics. He met my mum there, Lakshmi Pasord, the noted Trinidadian author. Dad was captain of the uh, university's West Indian cricket team, and mum was the head of the uh, local West Indian um, association. And apparently love was born when mum told him off at a public meeting for being late to cricket practice. Mum spent the rest of their married life telling him off. Northern Ireland was rife with religious strife back then. This was the 1960s. Uh, religious strife between the Catholics and Protestants. It was hard to escape it. Uh, everything was seen through sectarian lines. Mum recalls that when she was being interviewed to be accepted into a hall of residence, the warden asked her whether she was Protestant or Catholic, and mum replied she was Hindu. And after pause, the warden asked, is that Catholic Hindu or Protestant Hindu? Oddly enough, given that both were humanists and not believers, Northern Ireland of the 1960s may have politicized them, seeing so many injustices carried out in the name of God. Dad grew up in a rice farm, on a rice farm in rural Guyana. Agriculture was a major part of, uh, of economic activity and development, and he was always very interested in agriculture. Later, he earned a PhD in agricultural economics at Reading University uh, and in the sugar industry. After a few important research posts in the Caribbean, he was appointed chief, then deputy, then director of economic affairs at the Commonwealth Secretariat. Back then, there were many newly independent countries looking for help to develop their economies and guide their policies from the Secretariat. Given his background in agriculture, he knew of the difficulties of former colonies struggling to adapt to world markets and buffeted by geographical, ge ge geographical and environmental hazards like monsoons and hurricanes and, and droughts. The vulnerability index he pioneered took account of such factors, laying the ground for future schemes for third world debt relief. He also created insurance schemes to help those states regularly threatened by natural hazards. And he was one of the architects of the economic sanctions against apartheid South Africa, social justice always being very important to him. The Commonwealth played a very important part in the struggle against apartheid South Africa. One of his superpowers was that he was unafraid to think. Many people are. He would be so unafraid to think and so confident that he would always have a new idea that he was also unafraid to give away ideas and advice to, to the many, especially the many politicians who kept on calling. And with modest success, he tried to teach his kids this skill too. Every Sunday when growing up at 12 p.m., he would call down uh, myself and, and my two siblings were Jendra and Sharda. Uh, we'd be upstairs trying to finish our homework. He'd call us down and he would open a rather shabby red old notebook. 
where he'd written down a series of topics to think about. He would give us each one and tell us to come back at around 1 p.m. that day in an hour's time with our conclusions. And in that hour, we weren't supposed to read up and research. We were supposed to just think about it. All of this thinking practice made him a man ahead of his time and often in some hot water. His favoring of the private sector in the developing world, still wedded to the idea of state planning, roused much suspicion in the late 1980s. He believed that peasant farmers and entrepreneurs had a lot to contribute to development and not just the state. He established one of the, of the very first emerging market investment funds, investing back then in the 80s in Malaysia, Barbados and Botswana across the three continents. It's mainstream now, but back then, investing in such markets and across so many was distinctly offbeat. During three years, he gently coaxed Manmohan Singh uh, when dad was deputy director and Manmohan Singh was director of economic affairs at the Commonwealth Secretariat. And, and he coaxed him into believing that liberalizing India from a welter of red tape would bring prosperity to each and the poorest. Many Indians leapt out of poverty thanks to the growth that followed these radical market reforms introduced by Singh when he served uh, India as Prime Minister. He was an advisor in reports to several UN commissions. He was one of the first to emphasize environmental degradation and risks back in the 1980s, long before it was fashionable. He helped to set up the Iwakwama program to sustain the world's rainforest. One of his other superpowers was he recognized what he considered to be his shortcomings. And he knew that these shortcomings are often passed down from generation to generation, from parents to their kids. And he strove to ensure that that would not be the case. He was, for instance, a shy, quiet man. And he sent his kids off to drama school and encouraged us all to take plenty of risk. Whenever I would be a little nervous about taking a public position uh, or uh, pick, taking up an unpopular cause, and I would call him up hoping for some sensible caution from a sensible, cautious man, he would say, Avi, be a player, go for it. He played a quiet, modest game. Cricket fans might say he played within the crease but with deep impact. And he touched all of us, all of those with his kindness, his quietness, his courage, his generosity. He had a wide following. He was awarded the Companion of Honor in the Barbados National Honors List in 2013 and passed away in 2016. It is fitting that Francois Villois Gallo, the Gallo, will deliver this year's Bishendat Pursord Memorial Lecture. I've known and followed Francois for, for a bit since he kindly invited me to contribute a paper to the Bank de France's Financial Stability Review, an invitation that no one turns down. The review has developed a strong reputation of being the most thought-provoking and cutting-edge review of financial stability, and it's eagerly awaited every year. The governor of the Bank de France has a long and distinguished career as an economist, in the public service, starting off at the Trésor, before in 2015 being appointed governor of the bank and a member of the governing council of the European Central Bank. He's played critical roles in preserving financial stability as chairman of the regulator and member of the uh, European Systemic Risk, uh, Risk, Systemic Risk Board. And while being committed to the good state and just society, he has an understanding and recognition of the role of the private sector, and the fine tradition of the best of France, he has straddled the highest echelons of business as well as the public service with senior positions at BNP Paribas. Today, he is a senior member of the world's elite central bankers. At a time of great challenge, from financial stability to COVID to climate change. And many would say that central bankers have been asked too much and too much has been expected of them. Over the past 12, Years, there have been over $25 trillion of quantitative easing. Arguably, they have delivered uh, that easing there to support the major economies through these challenges. Central bankers play a game 
of fine balance. The recent jump in European inflation is a sign that there's no let up in striving for the right balance. And like you, I'm eager to hear Francois's perspective. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to participate in this Warwick Economic Summit in your world-renowned university. I would have preferred to be with you today, but I'm also deeply honored to offer today the very first of the Persaud lectures. Professor, thank you for your kind words about myself. Thank you for participating five years ago in this Financial Stability Review. It was, by the way, about bank regulation, and your contribution was very welcome. And thank you first and foremost for what you told us about your father. It's a wonderful story. Uh, it's a story of courage. It's a story of hope in India and in Europe, because Europe and Britain played its role. And it's a family story. If you allow me a personal word, as a father and a grandfather, I'm old enough now to be grandfather, perhaps I could still take some receipts from what your father did. And especially, I admired how you spoke about your father. And if you allow me, it's a smile, but it's also serious. I will perhaps tell my son and my grandsons about what you just said. Uh, and I, I, think, I think of your father, wherever he is, you pay tribute to him in a really moving manner. But you created a problem for me, because <laughs> what you told about your father was so interesting, so unexpected, uh, that afterwards what I will say perhaps could look a bit serious or boring, but I, I will do my best. Thank you, thank you again, and I appreciate the honor. Uh, if I come to what I intended to, to, to say today, to make the things perhaps more seducive, I borrowed my title from the famous French writer Alexandre Dumas, 20 years later. It was a sequel to The Three Musketeers. Uh, January 1st, by the way, marked 20 years since the introduction of the euro as cash. Obviously, central banking is not quite as much fun as the tales of D'Artagnan and his friends. But our young currency has had a few adventures, and it is worth drawing some lessons from them. I will then turn to the next 20 years and the two main transformations, digital and ecological, facing Europe. But before I plunge into this longer view, allow me to say a few words about the European Central Bank's latest monetary policy decisions as set out by ECB President Christine Lagarde. Yesterday, in the face of increasing uncertainty on inflation, our key word was, I quote, more than ever, optionality. We take this word seriously. We retain our full optionality on the decisions we will make from March and in the following quarters, informed then by the latest data forecast and geopolitical developments. And as we clearly stick to our sequencing, starting first with tapering, and second, liftoff. We will also retain our full optionality about the pace of this sequence and timing of moving from one stage to the other. Hence, while the direction of the journey is clear, one shouldn't rush to conclusions about its calendar. This calendar will remain gradual, state-dependent, and open in each of its steps. So, back to the tale of the euro. You students are pro 
probably too young to remember the politics of the 90s. But it's worth reminding ourselves of how far we have come. When we recall that the European Union had only 12 members when the Maastricht Treaty was signed 30 years ago in 1992, we realize how much the world has changed. Towards the EU counts 27 members. Among them, 19 countries have adopted the euro. The addition of Croatia and Bulgaria will soon bring the latter number up to 21. This is impressive progress. But there was, of course, a significant loss. The UK opted out of the single currency from the start and has more recently exited the EU altogether. We continentals may regret those decisions. We do regret those decisions, but we respect them. We will miss great British architects of our projects, like former Chancellor Sir Kenneth Clark, whom I can personally testify to how much he contributed. What we do sometimes regret is when Britain's vibrant debate on European issues verge on schadenfreude in relation to our own projects and ambition. Take, for instance, Sir William Cash, a long-standing Conservative member of Parliament, who at a debate on Euro membership in 1997 insisted that, I quote, the Euro would be extremely weak and that, I quote again, we are heading for disaster. 14 years la later, in 2011, Bill Cash wrote that the euro with its one-size-fits-all approach and the uniformity demanded by the EU simply cannot work. The survival of the euro itself is in question due to its structural shortcomings and the inherent workings of monetary union. Unquote. Well, here we are, more than a decade later, and the euro is still alive and kicking. Not only has the euro survived, but it is recognized and used globally, including outside its own borders. The single currency has also proved remarkably stable. With inflation, and if we could turn to the next slide, please, uh, averaging 1.7% since its inception in 1999, despite its recent surge, compared with an inflation, as you can see it, of 4.9% during the two previous decades. The euro has therefore helped to protect the purchasing power of European citizens, which has increased as an average by 15% since 1999. Moreover, the euro is not simply an elite project, as is frequently charged. It is also a popular success. It implies trust, which is a core value of a currency. I don't know if you are aware of these figures, but the latest standard euro barometer poll conducted last year reported that 79% of the population in the euro area believe that having the currency is good for them and for the EU. That is up, and we can turn to the next slide, from 66% a decade ago. And you saw especially, and this was two decades ago, sorry, uh, and you saw especially the progress in Germany. Even well-known nationalist politicians, including in my own country, I don't quote any name, have dropped or backed off their anti-euro stances because they have concluded that this policy would be an electoral dead air. Obviously, as governor of the Banque de France and the Committee European, I enjoy reading out those numbers. Yet, I do not wish to be simplistic or Panglossian. The URA had problems over the years, most notably resulting in the sovereign debt crisis in the early 2010s. That crisis was a reminder that by forging a currency union before a political union existed, we were doing, yes, something unprecedented. Yet, European political leaders have ultimately proved themselves to be pragmatic, backing the European Central Bank in its defense of the euro. 
lessons were learned. And when the COVID crisis hit two years ago, the EU gave the region's economy appropriate fiscal support. The combined stimulus provided by the EU and national governments was comparable to that of the US and the UK. Meanwhile, on the monetary front, the ECB did its part in supplying stimulus also on par with that of other developed countries. There is, however, still progress to be made, and let me elaborate a bit about that. Our monetary and economic union needs to be completed. Can we turn to the next slide? Our European economies institutions are like a tree marron. Our vessel already has a robust central hull in the form of the ECB and the Euro system with its credible single monetary policy. But this boat must be completed with two floaters. On one side, we need a public float with a standing common fiscal capacity to better cope with macroeconomic shocks. This does not mean increasing permanently our yearly budget. Rather, we should construct, according to me, a fiscal fac facility that could be activated in moments of crisis or recession. In this respect, the famous 700 billion, 750 billion of the next generation EU program agreed in 2020 and now actively implemented has been a major step forward. On the other side, as you can see, we need a private flow to foster a better capital allocation, which is just as important. The banking union and capital markets union, through somewhat boring and technical, should be absolute political priorities to enhance the free circulation of capital across the EU and build what I suggest to rebrand a financing union for investment and innovation. If I look at the US, private capital flows are a major financial shock absorber between states. And can we please turn to the next slide? We can achieve the same in Europe and make better use of the world's largest pool of savings. You see it in the left part, around 300 billion euro of excessive saving each year, including by fostering, and this is our weakness at present, if you look at the right part, fostering venture capital, which is still underdeveloped. Uh, this is, these are the funds levied uh, in uh, uh, the last 10 years by the 10 most important uh, venture capitalists, both in US and in Europe. All these initiatives, public and private, are key to ensuring our capacity to finance the two great transformations, if you allow me this brand, ecological and digital, that we will all have to pursue in the long run. Both require very significant investments in the coming year, and hence a co-financing by the public and the private sectors. It is healthy to encourage convergence of private actors with policy goals set by public authorities. And if I remember what you said, Professor Persaud, about your father, I think he wouldn't disagree with this convergence between private actors and policy actions. Allow me here to turn to some great economists of the last century to shed some light on these transformations. The first of them is obviously Joseph Schumpeter and his creative destruction with the decisive role of private innovation. But we shouldn't forget Karl Polanyi, another Austria-Hungary-born economist or historian. And his great transformation, his seminal opus written in Britain and published in 1944, Polanyi warned of the dangers of changing a market economy into a market society, and hence of purely self-regulated markets forgetting about social and political institutions. We might say that his ideas are the structural side 
of what Keynes wrote on cyclical policies. I am convinced that to succeed in the face of the challenges of both the modern economy and democratic discontent, we will need to reconcile the ideas of these great, these three great thinkers, Schumpeter, Polanyi, and Keynes. And this brings me to the 20 years ahead and the two great transformations. I will start with the digital revolution, where Europe is still lagging behind the United States and China. Can we turn to the next slide? Compared to the United States, and you will see it, we spend less on R&D, have fewer researchers. Can we please have the next slide? Uh, and have filed fewer patents. You see it on the right, particularly in biotechnology and in ICT, information and communication technologies. We nevertheless have reasons to cheer. Last year, 21, around 100 billion euro were invested in the European ecology and technology ecosystem, almost three times the previous record of 2020, with around 100 new European unicorns. Furthermore, also technologies have not yet shown their full potential in terms of productivity, and this is the next slide. We may be at a turning point with the latest advances in artificial intelligence, biotechnologies, or telework related reorganizations. After a lag between innovation and productivity, which corresponds to the process of appropriating these technologies by the so-called economic fabric, investment training, etc. If I focus now uh, on the monetary, financial and payment spheres, which are our responsibility as central bankers, these disruptions are also reflected there. And digitalization is bringing about a triple revolution, which is far from over. First, the arrival of new players born from the tech world, fintechs and big techs mainly. Second, the emergence of new assets, crypto assets, and not cryptocurrencies. We will perhaps come to this wording debate. Crypto assets from the blockchain universe in the form of tokens. And third, the emergence of decentralized market infrastructures. New technologies tend to reduce the use of proven centralized settlement systems. These revolutions positively offer the potential for increased market efficiency while reducing costs and time. But they entail several risks, and they could lead to significant concentration effect among a few dominant private networks. This is an apparent paradox because everybody is speaking of decentralized finance. But this, who, this private platforms would in practice re-intermediate, but without the trust and regulation associated with the architecture of the monetary and financial edifice that public and private players have built together over a period of decades. In the face of this major challenge, we, public regulators, need to both innovate and regulate. I insist on this conjunction, innovate and regulate. For some, the conjunction between the two should be an or considering them mutually exclusive. Innovation in the form of a central bank digital currency would be an alternative, indeed the only alternative in that view, to the unchecked development of decentralized finance. For me, the conjunction, you understand it, is an end. The two pillars clearly work together to foster sustainable innovation. This is why the EU should at once adopt the MICA regulations on crypto assets in the first half of this year and prepare innovation for a central bank digital currency, the e-euro, by 2026. But the worst conjunction 
would be neither nor. Revolutions always happen quickly. And we are at risk of neither innovating nor regulating in time. In that case, we as public authorities would have failed in our historical mission and jeopardize centuries of work building up confidence in our money. Let me now turn to the second major transformation on the way, the ecological transition, which is an absolute necessity at the global level, even if Europe here, contrary to the digital revolution, Europe, Europe here lies ahead. Climate change is accelerating, obviously. And yes, policies to fight climate change should imperatively include an appropriate carbon price, even if it's not very popular. Rest assures that central banks will do their part, will do everything they can do. The ECB Monetary Policy Strategy Review, concluded last summer under Christine Lagarde's leadership, sets out, sets out an ambitious action plan leaning up to 2024, two years ahead. But central banks and financial intermediaries cannot solve everything, and they cannot substitute for adequate and sometimes difficult public policies. The ecological transition is an absolute imperative worldwide, but it holds risks, including on inflation, as a gradual switch to greener energies may entail higher and more volatile prices, at least in the intermediate phase. Central banks are closely monitoring this increasing debate about a possible greenflation. Let me give some light on that, very preliminary. So far, in the short run, the evidence points to a non-negligible but limited direct contribution of climate policy in the recent increase in inflation. For example, the implementation of a carbon tax in Germany last year has had a discernible impact in 2021, discernible but as said limited, combined with other measures to tackle climate change, the overall impact on German consumer prices is estimated at 0 0.4 percentage point last year. So you see that climate tradition, transition is far from being the primary cause of the recent surge in energy prices across the world. Indeed, this surge has more to do with a combination of global factors, rapid demand recovery from the pandemic-induced recession, supply disruptions, geopolitical tensions. Afterwards, beyond the short run, beyond our projection horizon, the transition to net zero might have a more significant impact on inflation, especially if it were to be disorderly. But I will speak here using the conditional, because frankly, I will insist on that. We don't know yet. The net zero transition would, if disorderly, result in a negative supply shock, in particular, if the capacity increase in alternative energy sources were too slow. In addition, the reallocation of demand involved by the transition might trigger relative prices changes in some sectors. Furthermore, the level of R star, I don't know if all of you are aware of R star, uh, the natural interest rates, which we discuss among central bankers and economists. R star could also be affected in two opposite ways. Higher green investment will increase it, but a negative impact on productivity growth would reduce it. On many of these questions, it's too early to tell. We need urgently more analytical work on the macroeconomic modeling of climate transition. And the NGFS, the Network for Greening the Financial System, which we created in Paris, whose global secretariat is provided by the Banque de France, 
the Network for Greening the Financial System will provide macrofinancial scenarios by the end of this year. More than ever, monetary policy will remain a judgment exercise, looking through temporary phenomena while averting lasting increases in inflation. Open question, but one thing is certain. The sooner we start the transition, the better. The better to ensure long-term sustainable growth and price stability. And here I come to my conclusion. In economic and financial matters, there is always a degree of uncertainty. And obviously, still more today, 20 years later after the euro and 20 years ahead of these two great transformation. Allow me one word in French. The word espérance. I don't know if you are familiar with our nice language, but just to, to, to learn you one word, espérance has two meanings in French. And this is interesting. It means hope and it means mathematical expectations. This espérance has been the driver for Europe and the Euro in both its meanings. Daring decisions made by visionary men and women in the past decades have proved winning bets. They were guided by the same conviction. I used Alexandre Dumas to introduce my speech. May I conclude with another French writer? Georges Bernanos is less well known, but he wrote in the last century, 1941, a letter to the English. And this was during the war, with the great admiration and tribute we French and we Europeans owe to the British resistance at that time. I quote him, it is in my reason, not my heart, that lies the principle of any invisible hope, espérance. I thank you for your attention. Monsieur. Villois. That was an incredibly informative speech. And we have, quite you, a few, we have quite a few questions from our lovely audience. The most popular one seems to be, why do you think there are structural differences between the EU and the US, leading to the US having more dynamism? Oh, this is a very broad question. <laughs> um, so let us take the EU, and I will speak, if you allow me, mostly about the euro area, which is a bulk economically uh, of the EU, and of course. The EU without Britain. Uh, if I look at the size of our economies, it's more or less comparable. But there are two differences. The first difference is obviously our social model. And we should say now not only social model, but environmental model also. So our collective preferences are different, obviously. And when you see the level of inequalities, the level of public services, the level of awareness on the ecological transition, clearly uh, Europe and UK, by the way, because we are still quite close on, on this model, have different preferences from the American society. I don't say it's better, but this is a result of democracy. And it's not by chance. I mentioned the fact that there are 19 countries in the EU area, 27 in the EU. Obviously, there are differences between these 19. But there are less differences between these 19 than the Atlantic gap on uh, this collective model. The second difference is what you mentioned, it's about the speed. And the weight is more or less the same, but if I look at growth and if I look at innovation, clearly it's more brilliant in the US. 
So what are the explanation for that? And I will be very short. I could be very long, Iman, because it's a, it, it's a very good question. Is it due to the former factor, the different social preferences and different social model? Obviously, for many people, it's the first candidate for explanation. I personally don't think so at all. I could be very long, but I will be very short. That uh, if I look within Europe, the countries which are the most efficient in growth and innovation are the northern countries, to put it in a nutshell. And not only Germany, Sweden, Netherlands, etc. And they are the most innovative countries. Spotify is not born, unfortunately, in France or in Portugal. It's in Sweden, etc. So they are the best signs that there is no contradiction. A second candidate for explanation is to say, look at the macroeconomic policies. Uh, and this was perhaps the hypothesis of the question, to say, look, your monetary policy has been less aggressive or uh, less stimulative than the American one, especially in the great financial crisis. It can have played a role. Your fiscal policy has been less coordinated and you had two strict rules, it could have played a role in some southern countries 10 years ago. But if I look at this crisis, obviously the macroeconomic reaction, I mentioned it in my speech, was more or less the same. And we learned the lessons. And then, if it's not about Keynes, because macroeconomic policy would refer to Keynes, I think it's about Schumpeter. We have a deficit of innovation because we have a deficit of education, and especially in the southern countries, and we have a deficit of funding, especially in equity. And I don't know if you remember this slide I showed on venture capital. Uh, and so uh, there is absolutely no imperative for Europe uh, to be deadlocked, so to say, in a, a pace of innovation and growth which would be durably much weaker. We must address, especially in Southern Europe, these two rooms for maneuvers on education, vocational training, apprenticeship, and uh, this cross-border funding of our collective savings, which is abundant. So I, I believe this is our challenge. We shouldn't be complacent. Uh, we shouldn't, on the other side, conclude that uh, as I said, it's a deadlock or there is no solution. We have the best examples within Europe. And frankly, if we can achieve the best of the American model on innovation and the best of the European model on social cohesion and ecological transition, I think it's worth having this challenge. I don't say anything about the UK. You, you noticed it, Iman. Yes. Because as usual, as usual, UK is, and if you look at the figures, it's very interesting. As usual, UK is somewhere in between continental Europe and the US, but a bit closer to, to continental Europe uh, in this regard, and also interested in this positive reconciliation, which I sometimes call the positive reconciliation between Keynes and Schumpeter. If you allow me one last sentence on this issue, as you know, Keynes was a European, born in Britain, passed away in Britain, and if I may still consider him as a great European. Schumpeter was born in Europe, in Austria, but he passed away in the US. And I always find it a bit symbolic, this life. But we have to remember that he was also a European. I, I stop here. Thank you so much for that insightful response. We have, wow, we have quite a few people who are very curious um, about what type of regulation you think should accompany the potentially digitalized euro to prevent a currency bubble arising. Uh, I, I hope I understand the question right. Uh, there are probably two separate issues the issue of the digital currency, central bank digital currency, digital euro, and the issue of regulation. If I may separate the two issues, I, I think it's clearer. 
About the digital euro, uh, this is a question all central banks, all governments have at present. As you know, there had been projects in Sweden, which is outside of the euro area. First, there are projects in China. There are questions in the euro area. We are a bit more advanced than the UK or, or the US because we decided uh, last year uh, in July to uh, create a framework, an experimentation, which we will study in the next two years. And we will have the lesson of this experimentation by the end of 23. Uh, here I see no specific question of regulation or, or of currency bubble. Uh, the value of the e-euro will be the value protected, stabilized by the central bank. It's probably more a question of use case. Uh, how will we convince ordinary citizens or corporates or merchants to use partially a e-euro besides the credit cards of bank money or besides a banknote? It's increasing the freedom of choice, so to say. We still think there are interesting progress with the e-euro, but it will be mainly a discussion of use case. And obviously, nobody will constrain private citizens or uh, economic agents to adopt the EU. So, for me, it will be an additional freedom of choice for citizens, bringing something on technology. I come to the regulation part. Uh, this is about private crypto assets. Sorry to be a bit short about a complex issue, but mainly two kinds of private assets, and both of them are linked to blockchain. Bitcoin-like, uh, which are, so to say, the stars of the game due to their very speculative nature. They went very high. In recent times, they went more downwards. Uh, and there was this idea that everybody can get rich or richer by buying Bitcoins. This is an illusion. Some people go to each other, but if you look at the long-term uh, financial history, speculation always has an end. So I, I don't say at all that investment in Bitcoin should be prohibited, but it, there should be clear information on that, no illusion. It's a risky investment, and so it's only for investors who are not too much risk adverse. Uh, and then you have the other part, which are the so-called stable coins. Think of this former project by Facebook called Libra. Why are they different? Because here they have a guaranteed value. One Libra was supposed to equal one dollar or, or one euro. Apparently the project is left aside, at least for a time, but there are other stable coins, less known. Why regulation on these two issues? First, to be sure, and this is common sense, they, they don't allow money laundering, financing of terrorism, dark web, etc. And when I speak of Bitcoin, this is not a theoretical requirement. We all know that. Second, to protect all investors or savers. Let us suppose you invest in a stable coin, whatever it is. You have the guarantee of the value of the currency, so it's much less speculative than the Bitcoin. But you must be sure that the private vehicle you invest in we will be able to redeem this sum, if you wish it, at any time. And this requires financial regulation. This is what we are discussing at global level. By the way, we started in 2019 in the G7. We had at that time the French presidency. We followed in the G20 uh, uh, the following year, 2020, and we are now implementing in each major jurisdiction in the US, uh, it's a so-called president working group with the Treasury and the Fed. Uh, in uh, EU, it's what I call MICA. We are implementing regulation, not at all to ban this innovation because they bring some things with the technology, but to be sure that they don't diminish trust. Anti-money laundering is an obvious requirement, and uh, informing, protecting savers is another one. Uh, if you allow me one last sentence, Iman. 
Of course. Sometimes people say innovation and stability cannot go together. And apparently it's the case. Innovation is moving very fast, stability is not moving. And we central bankers think they should go together. Why? Because in the long run, you need both to build trust. If an innovation does not inspire enough trust to its users, it will not last. And stability of the value belongs to trust. On the other side, if stability is only conservatism without incorporating new technologies, it will be a regression. So I think that in the long run, innovation and stability converge for the better. And this is our task. Sorry for having been a bit long, but it was also an important question. Oh, I completely understand. That was a very insightful answer. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I have one final question. Should it be a government's role to spark innovation investment in Europe, or is it something best left to the private market? Uh, the short answer is probably both, both of them. Uh, I believe in free market, as Professor Persaud was kind enough to remind, I spent 12 years of my career in a private bank. Uh, I meet entrepreneurs and innovators very often, and to imagine that innovation can be only on the public side would be a tragical mistake. But uh, let us look at the climate transition, for instance. Many of these new energies, as we know, are not profitable from day one, to, to say the least. They require huge investment needs, huge investment needs. Uh, and I spoke about the energy sector, but if I come to the industry and the digital transformation each industrial corporate will have to undertake in the next years, it's probably sometimes beyond their reach. And so you need some public goods in the form of research on hydrogen, for instance, investment in prototypes. Uh, the sooner we can go to the private sector uh, and purely market economic, the better. But as these are significant disruptions with high risks, with very long returns, we sometimes need public investment to make them profitable. And uh, we know we need them from a collective perspective. Uh, this is the economic definition of common goods. We need them. But if you rely only on private interests, to quote Adam Smith, on your bachelor's interests, to provide, to create, innovate, imagine this common good, probably you won't have them. So I'm not saying at all that the public sector is more qualified. I also believe in pari passu mechanism uh, as often uh, uh, as possible. But sometimes you need the longer term and the investment capacity of public authority. This is more or less the purpose of next generation EU. Uh, and it's associating public funding to private investment, you can provide it through guarantees, you can be pari passu. Uh, I think it's a good way to proceed. But again, uh, the sooner we, we can be out of this learning curve, this starting investment, the better towards private investors. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a couple minutes left. Um, and so I was wondering if I could just ask you one more question. Do European economies require any special incentives relative to US to increase investment in venture capital? Uh, this is also a very good question. Uh, I, I will try to, 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 to keep my answer short. Uh, we could ask why uh, all our venture capital funds are significantly smaller. Uh, if you take, let me give you an example which elaborates still a bit more uh, than the slide I show. If I take the list of the 10 most important funds in the US and the list of the 10 most important funds in Europe, the number one in Europe happens to be two times smaller than the number 10 in the US. And I don't know if it's a satisfaction, but this number one happens to come from the UK. But it's too small also. 
uh, number two or number three, is all, all the others come from Euralia, but e even for this fund, it's too small. Why? We have the same economic size. We have more savings, as I said, this 300 billion of excess savings each year, uh, the US don't have it at all. As you know, it's the contrary. They import savings from the rest of the world. There are several explanations. There could be the tax regimes. There could be cultural explanations. But I think the main one is that we lack cross-border funds. And let me give you this very simple explanation. Each of our funds in Europe, including in the UK, is within domestic borders, mainly. So they don't refer to the size of the European markets, they refer to the size of UK, France, Germany, which is about a sixth or something like that of the American market. We have now the single market for goods and services. We must have a single market for financing as a whole and for equity and venture capital in particular. Uh, it's not as simple as it seems, because you have this question of the tax regime, for instance, which is very important for uh, venture capital, and we know that tax policies are domestic responsibilities. But there is a kind of competition, a convergence of favorable regime. Uh, UK, France lied a bit ahead. When I look at Germany, it's making progress, etc. So, we are not very far from having cross-border venture capital. And I think this is clearly a case where public institutions could help. We have the EIB, European Investment Bank, with the EIF, European Investment Fund. Why not to organize here pari passu mechanism? If there is a private fund within Europe which is cross-border and with 100 uh, private savings, the EIF would follow suit 100. It's not a theory, man. It's what happened in Israel. It's what happened in California, which, which are not um, planned economy countries. Uh, and so we, we have several incentives to develop this cross-border venture capital fund. I think this is the main explanation. And if, Thank you, you, I, I, if you agree, I, I will stop here. This is what Capital Markets Union is about. And probably our failure is not to have convinced still politicians that it is politically attractive and necessary to increase innovation in Europe. But Europe lacks equity. Uh, and when you are financed for equities as an entrepreneur, you are much more risk taker and innovative. I think it's not too complex uh, to over all this gap. This is my wish, at least for the 20 years to come, and, and even quicker. Well, thank you very much for this speech and for this Q&A. It was incredibly informative, and we are very grateful to have you speak at our summit today. We will be back in, at 5 o'clock. We're just going to take a short break for now. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, and goodbye. And goodbye. thank you to Professor Pessoa.